Well, how did you do? Let's go back to Lamar's tape and see what actually happened in Nevada, besides Lamar losing all his summer's wages in the casino. At this point, in order for us to meet our objectives safely, we needed adequate resources in place to handle any spots outside the line. It was essential that we hold it because of the ranch and community down canyon. By 1700, the firing crew had burned out and secured the corner at point B, and the dozer had pushed past the head of the fire. The crew started burning out again around 1730, but not before assigning an engine and an NDF crew to hold and begin mopping up the corner at point B. By 1900, the dozer was tied back into the ridge line leaving only a short section of line for the crew to burn out and secure. By 1930, the crew had completed the firing operations and was now also tied into the ridge line. Well, Lamar, it seems like that situation turned out okay. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, Ted, I, like, I wrote a few notes here. And uh, First of all, I'd like to say that I think the IC3, IC3 did an excellent job in briefing us and other resources on current fire behavior prior to us getting there. Uh, going back to uh, what John Krebs said, the grouping of the fire orders. Um, first, we need to know fire behavior, weather, before we can come up with an operational plan. I think we did that there. Before we can fight fire safely and provide for safety, we need, some, we need to know fire behavior. Uh, secondly, there were uh, two primary briefings. Uh, both were similar in that they were developed through a process of LCES, but the one key element that was present in both of those briefings was an incident pocket guide. Uh, we actually utilized the downhill checklist quite a bit. Um, you actually and, pulled it out on the line and, and, and had a, a meeting from right. the mines right there and, and actually physically went over that list. Right. There was, um, included in that meeting, there were, there were quite a few of us included in the meeting. Most were overhead from other resources, uh, resources that were going to be helping us on the operation. But we actually pull that pocket guide out. And it's easy to do, you know, we just keep it right in our pockets here. It's small enough that we can work with it. And you can keep it as a part of your, your, your pack or whatever you use to carry on the line every day. But we actually utilized that checklist. And I think what it did was actually brought up the comfort level of each individual on the fire. It, we had resources from outside the region that were on that fire. And it made them feel better about what our plans were for that day. Um, the last thing that I'd like to mention is that um, there was one area of concern, one critical area that we need to work with, and that was the corner. Uh, at we point B. Point B. Uh, if you look at your student workbooks on page 13, that illustration at point B is the one we're talking about. We needed to shoot up that corner, and we needed to handle that corner. And if we, if we couldn't do that, we actually couldn't go forward with this operation. Um, we looked at it, uh, myself, the strike team leader of the division, uh, the IC3 all walked down, took a look at it. It was doable. It was totally doable. Uh, we walked back up. We discussed it. I went to my crew. Uh, these guys, some of the other guys, went to their resources, their, their crews. We talked about it. We started the process. Um, the one thing that needed to happen also was that as we worked down that line, we need to make sure that we had resources spread out, uh, covering our backsides, uh, meaning that we brought fire down with us to the corner. Uh, we needed to get to that corner in adequate enough time that where we could get in there, uh, get those resources in that area to secure that corner. Uh, the end result is that, we, that it worked out fine. The, uh, the dozer got in position. Um, I was with the dozer most of the day. Uh, we did have a spot over, and that's the one thing I probably should mention, but we had resources in that area. All three lookouts uh, spotted at about the same time. Uh, and we had resources in that area, and I think it only was, uh, we we're looking at probably a tenth of an acre, but it was handled very, very quickly. Um, we tied the line in, and, and, and the thing that made, I think, this operation as successful as it was, was that um, we had adequate resources. Um, we utilized the downhill checklist. And saying that again is that it brought up the comfort level yep. for each individual on that, on that fire. And we had competent personnel firefighters. Yeah, you, you know, that's one thing I noticed. You had plenty of resources on that we one. We had a lot and, of resources. Uh, you, got, you know, that, that was a luxury uh, to me. I was thinking, man, he's got a lot of people there that, that can serve as lookouts. I mean, I thought that was great. Now, Nicole, in engine operations, for example, on that same scenario, you might not be that lucky. I'm sure a lot of times you run out and you don't have those people available to post three different lookouts. How do you deal with that when the personnel really isn't uh, 
available? Well, that's something that we have to, you know, again, assess at the time. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to pull off a, a you know, something like this with six people. There's just no way, you know, that's, that's when I've got to back off and reassess and say, is it really worth it? You know, is, is there somewhere else somehow that we can go about this differently? You know, that, again, is a comfort level. Of course, I don't have 20 people, so, mm -hmm. you know, some people only have three people. Maybe order up more resources and just, and just wait. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah. A lot of really good points here on uh, this uh, downhill uh, procedure that uh, Lamar and, and these IC Type 3 and the other overhead uh, did here on this one day. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out about uh, downhill line construction is just to give you a little bit of analogy, um, let's just say you're going to go out and uh, fall a tree. Uh, you're on a fire and you're just really not up to that level of falling this huge diameter tree that's got the inside of it hollowed out and stuff. You know, what do we do? We back off. We say, let's bring somebody in, that Type C. Class C faller, let them drop the tree. In this case, they were totally qualified, had a lot of expertise there. You know, they went down the checklist to make sure that the situation, you know, at hand was one that they could really do. I'd say just a word of caution, if you feel that you're not at this level, you know, don't be attempting this just because you saw something on a, a little video like we're demonstrating you here today. Make sure that you do have competent people there with a lot of uh, experience and expertise to pull off something like this. Good point. Another thing that uh, I noticed on that scenario was Lamar and uh, the Hot Shots and the other crews that were working, they constantly reevaluated their tactics, uh, pointing out that area in the, the fire, point B, I believe it is, um, that's a trouble spot for them. Um, they had to slow down there. They had to take a step back and you know, make sure what they were doing was going to work. Uh, then they experienced a spot fire. Uh, you know, there were certain situations there that, you know, if, if they weren't keeping aware of what was going on, could have came back and bit them in the end. The other good lucky thing is that you had clean black that you were bringing with you with that burn, so that, that was obviously your safety zone of choice right there. Right, and it was. Um, we had a lot of resources in that corner, and, and it was kind of a no a go, no go kind of situation. We, we didn't actually have another plan. We didn't have a contingency plan, to be honest about it. We, we were going to utilize that two-track, and we knew we could do it. Uh, by, by going down, scouting it, and taking a look at it, we knew it was very doable. Um, we, but we knew we need to have those resources in that corner to make it all happen. Well, if, let's, say, uh, let's say you had one less crew or uh, you, know, you didn't have that dozer. Um, you know, do you still feel you could accomplish that? Or, or I, mean, I think even with, without the dozer, um, the Type 1 crew that we had in place was actually my crew. I, I felt like we could probably clear that road enough to where we could get in there and do it anyway. Because you knew, you knew your, their limitations <coughs> in, that, in exactly. that fuel type or, or you knew what they were experiencing. Right. <coughs> yeah, I felt I, I believe we could have made it. Okay. We could have made it work. Well, you got me all choked up. I know. That, that was a good job. You love that crew, don't you? <laughs> you guys got a good crew. Uh, anything else on downhill line construction in general? Nothing else? Uh, let me just pose one question to you, uh, Hector, and, and maybe Brad, too, because uh, aerially, aerial delivered firefighters a lot of times end up on top of the ridge, and we heard some of this in some of the uh, segments from people from the field. But when, uh, you know, that's always a tough call. When you see a fire mid-slope, you're on top of the ridge, and you, you're getting ready to send people down there to scout it out and, and to start an operation. Mm -hmm. You know you're walking through some green mm -hmm. to head to it. I mean, what kind of cautions or what red flags are going up in your head uh, when you are the, that person walking through the green heading down to a fire that's below you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that happens a lot and we don't talk about it very much. So I'm just trying, I want to get your thoughts on that. Safety zones. I mean, that's, that's before we even try to, you know, we, we land, get out on the ground. I mean, everybody has to know where their safety zone is. That's, that's got to be established right off the bat and, and the route to that safety zone. Um, you know, especially when you're, you're getting ready as an initial attack, uh, you're amped up, you're ready to get on that fire line. It's easy to, you know, overlook those things, but you, you can't approach a fire or, or go downhill to anything without, you know, your lookouts, your escape zones, and, you know, obviously communications, all that in place. But, I mean, for me, that's, that's the number one. 
I, I've seen it done a, a couple of different ways, Ted, you know, in, in hairball situations like that. Uh, one that I saw that uh, worked <coughs> quite well one time was uh, the first two jumpers we threw out of the plane. We actually threw them on the opposite ridge so that they could serve as lookouts while we walked down to this fire. You know, that was a, a good tactic, and that's one that can be used with helicopters and, and other aerial delivered uh, firefighters. Another one is, well, we just flat out didn't like being above the fire. So what we would do is just jump somewhere else and, and do it just like normal people and walk up from the bottom. It may take you a little longer at times. You know, it may be that you're not going to get there as fast, but if that's what you got to do in certain situations, that's what you have to do. You know, that's, that's a great point because, you know, there's been several times where we wanted to get close to that fire, but your gut feelings is saying, you know, we can't do this. There's, it's not going to happen. So choose to land somewhere beneath it and hike a ways or, you know, take the, the harder route. But, uh, you know, in the end, I felt much more comfortable about doing that. Error on the side of safety. Exactly. Anything from engine perspectives, uh, driving in? A lot of times when, you know, of course, when we drive into fires, a lot of times we're probably going to end up sometimes above the fire. So again, we kind of, you know, we're not being aerial delivered. We don't have the luxury of actually seeing what's, you know, below it at that time. Maybe at that point we'll take a drive back around, you know, hopefully find a place lower that we can actually, you know, get a good bird's eye view and then, you know, go, go from it, you know, go from it from that standpoint, you know. Okay. Good. We're not as fortunate. We walk in. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that I think about most is where I'm going to anchor this thing in at. I like all the points that everybody mentioned, but I think my biggest concern a lot of times after looking at what you guys were saying is where am I going to anchor this thing at? So that's one of my, big, my, my pet peeves there. I think one of the things too, you know, along with either on any of these fires, we've been talking quite a bit about, you know, fire behavior, that kind of stuff, but we haven't really hit on um, taking weather. I mean, that's, that's one thing, you know, we get our forecasts out of, out of our dispatch center usually every day. But when we're out there, we need to, you know, assign somebody to actually be taking the weather, so that way we're getting on the ground, uh, on the ground information. I mean, uh, I, you we're know, Lamar probably has a little bit more of a luxury than I do. You know, I, I've got six people, maybe I've got three people, and you know, it gets tough sometimes to try and, you know, take the time to do that weather. But I think I think that's a really important thing that we, you know, a key factor we need to be paying attention to also at all. You're right. We are lucky. Good we're point. Got, yeah, we got 20 individuals there that we got. We got half the crew that's got Bell Weather kits anyway. He's got radios. Um, go ahead, Dave. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I think that was a, a good discussion, and, and obviously you can see from this exercise and from our discussions that there are many, many factors in which you need to consider whenever you're attempting downhill line construction or indirect line construction. The first question you should answer is, is, this, is there a safer way to do this assignment? And if there is, why take the risk? Also, remember to view the downhill line construction guidelines as a useful tool in daily operations, like Lamar was saying. And don't just, it's not just something that you should read once at the beginning of each season. It's a, it's a tool to be utilized in day-to-day -day operations. So now to shift our focus a little bit, I'd like to ask our panelists some of their thoughts on some other issues important to, fi important to fire line safety. Uh, as you know, it's hard for us to cover everything there is relating to fire safety, but we still have several points, little discussion points that we'd like to kick around a, li a little bit. And I want to do this by uh, utilizing a question-answer format. I'll start by asking the panel some common questions that come up, it seems like, every year in refresher training. So why don't I start with this one. Um, besides the issues we've been talking about so far, what other aspects of fire should, you know, firefighters be concerned with that may pose a threat to their safety? In other words, like, what else out there can really harm us? Anybody want to take this on? I think, um, Ted, one of the big things that I'm dealing with a lot is um, inexperienced drivers. Um, whether that be on my engine crew, I've got, you know, brand new folks coming in thinking that um, just because they've been four-wheeling, you know, their whole lives up in the mountains that they, now they can take on a, an engine, you know, commercial-sized engine or smaller with a full tank of water and they think they can drive it the same way as, you know, their, their pickup trucks. And uh, that's, that's one thing, you know, maybe on a slower fire maybe I can give those people a little bit of a chance to start driving the engine. Another thing is, is you know, I'm sure with Lamar, you, sometimes you fly into areas, you get, you get put on a bus. Well, that bus driver's used to driving buses in town, and they're not used to driving them up in the, up in the mountains. So they gotta, you know, you gotta be pretty heads up about that. 
Fatigue is another big issue. Um, fatigue drivers, a lot of times, again, I may be the only driver assigned to that engine, and I'm dog tired. It's, it's a choice there where I've got to say, hey, we got to pull over here so I, I can get some sleep, you know, mm -hmm. going home. Mm, I agree with Nicole. When it comes to drivers, we, we, we crack down on our drivers quite a bit and make sure they don't drive too many hours. And sometimes we get in that thing to where we're, we're trying to get there really fast. We want to get there as quick as we can. We want, might want to beat the other crew there. Um, what happens is that sometimes that driver forgets that you've got eight other individuals in that box behind you, and they're bouncing around in the back of that box, and you've got to be careful just not to uh, cause a big-time accident doing that. A uh, point I'd like to make, uh, Ted, is uh, this year with this uh, new national fire plan and this increased budget, We've hired a lot of new personnel that are, uh, we're going to see out on the field this summer. Uh, it's going to be a new occupation to them. Uh, kind of referring back to one of the interviews we uh, saw earlier, uh, it was a firefighter referring to when she first started, uh, how a lot of the common uh, nomenclature and, and uh, acronyms, et cetera, were over her head. And we got to be real careful, the experienced people that are out there, you know, to make sure that our briefings, our terminology, et cetera, that we're back to the basics, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we're uh, doing all of our stuff geared towards all the people that are going to be out there in the field this year. And let's just understand that. Good point. You know, I guess what really stands out to me is uh, complacency. Um, it's easy to become complacent after several successes on fire assignments, but you know, we, we got to remain humble to the fact that it takes one mistake to get us in a bad situation. And another thing to uh, touch on what uh, Hector was talking about is if you don't understand something, ask the question. Slow down, you know, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, I don't understand what's going on here. You know, explain this to me, you know, prior to, to going ahead and, and doing what you're asked, you know. I think that's a real good point. Uh, also, yeah. along with the new personnel that Hector's talking about, we're going to have, uh, it seems becoming more and more popular to have out of region people assisting in home units when, when they get inundated with fires. Um, boy, I'll tell you, there's a lot of safety hazards that are geographically isolated. And listening to a safety briefing when I go to a new area that is, is extremely important, especially down in Florida. I mean, you have hazards that you're not used to in your home, home area. So I think that's one that can hurt you. Uh, but to kind of sum up this question, you know, Paul Gleason mentioned. Uh, that you should be a student of fire, and I think that's part of it. I mean, if somebody was like, tell me all the hazards there are to firefighting so that I know what to be aware of, well, that, that's, an, that's an awfully long list, and, and it's going to take you an awful long time to ever even remember it, let alone get it down on paper. And I think being a student of fire helps that. Every season you should find another hazard that you weren't aware of that, that you can kind of keep, keep heads up about the next time you go out. So I encourage everybody to do that. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, and the next question I'm going to ask the panel is, how do the common denominators of fire behavior on tragedy fires play into some of the other issues that we've been discussing? Hector, common denominators? Let us refer back to the uh, Gibson Bench Fire in Colorado, the example uh, we saw earlier. If uh, the students could uh, refer back to page 11 of the student workbook and also to page 8 in your incident pocket guide. Um, let me go down this list right here. And let's talk about a real typical fire, the Gibson Bench Fire. How many fires we go to that are just like this? And how many common denominators might come up even on one of these smaller fires? Let's just start at the top. Incidents that may happen on smaller fires or isolated portions of larger fires. Well, it was definitely a smaller fire, wasn't it? Very characteristic of others that we've seen in this area that may have blown up at one time. Going down to number two. Fires that look innocent before flare-ups or blow-ups, in some cases tragedies occur in the mop-up stage. Fairly docile towards the latter parts of the evening there, but we saw it make its runs earlier. Flare-ups that generally occur in deceptively light fuels. In this particular situation, this would have been one of these uh, common denominators that probably didn't apply to this situation, but uh, it's, it's definitely one, not one you want to take lightly, referring back to man gulch and, and other fires like that in light fuels. Fires that run uphill surprisingly fast in chimneys, gullies, or on steep slopes. Well, look at the topography that we had there. Uh, the gullies, the chimneys adjacent to the area that we were actually fighting fire in. I think this one was definitely apparent in this situation. Wind in which uh, direction or wind, sp wind speed unexpectedly shifts. Never really had these uh, real weird wind shifts, but the wind speed was a factor. 
And uh, that was illustrated, you know, by our streamers, and, and we knew that, you know, when we were out in the air. In fact, I would have hated to be on a round parachute that day, Ted. That would have been pretty tricky. <laughs> um, you know, so, so just to uh, reiterate uh, how important uh, it is to recognize these common denominators. What sounds like a real easy fire, which it ended up being a great deal and stuff, you know, we go down this list and just about every one of those was right there, you know, uh, on that fire that day. And again, that's one of those deals where if everything works out well, nobody even thinks about it. Yeah. But if, uh, if something would have happened on that fire and things would have, would have gotten bad, it definitely would have been brought up. Geez, look at this. All these common den den denominators for tragedy fires were present. Did anybody notice it? So these are things you should keep in mind. Lamar, you got any comments on that? You know, the one that sticks out to me more than anything is that first one you were talking about. Uh, most incidents happen on smaller fires, uh, isolated larger fire, portions of larger fires. And I think what happens is we tend to get a little bit more displacing, uh, a harbor, a sense of uh, false security. And, and the same hazards exist on that small fire that, that, has, that exists on a larger fire. And I think each individual needs to realize that and not forget it. Yeah, good point. Let's go on to the next one. What do you do when you're asked something, uh, when you're asked to do something that you feel is unsafe? And we get this an awful lot. Is it ever okay to say no? Uh, this is a real tough question. Brad, you want to tackle this one? Yeah, every firefighter has the right to say no to an assignment that they uh, are not comfortable with. However, um, I believe, you know, you have that right to say no, but don't just turn down an assignment. Maybe you can uh, talk with the operational people and, and figure out why, uh, you know, you feel it's unsafe. Maybe there's a solution to, uh, you know, tackle this assignment uh, in a safer manner. Um, the reason I say that is, you know, perhaps by turning down this assignment, you could be jeopardizing the other personnel uh, later on, on in the fire, you know. But if the, if it does end up that there's no way to accomplish that safely, then that's fine. But uh, I don't think it's it's just left up to say, hey, no, we don't want to do that. I think we should look for solutions and and, and try to try to do this in the safest way. Well, like like you were saying, but I I, get, I think you got to make sure that you kind of negotiate a little bit. Uh, there are some. Maybe we can do this, but maybe we need to just mitigate this problem. And I think me and you, Tay, were talking about that the other day. We, we can't just, you know, a lot of times we get in those situations. It, it might not be um, the right thing to just say no, flat out no. But, but if we look at it, let's go down and take a look at this area. Um, maybe if we uh, found a different route in, we can yeah. make this happen. Maybe we need to give up a little bit of land here, an acreage. Add a yeah. lookout. Add a lookout. You know what I mean? We can mitigate some of the problems there. Right. I'm with you on that. I don't like the idea of, of people using uh, their right to say no as an excuse to get out of good hard work, um, which I'm afraid may happen once in a while. But at the same time, the way I always looked at it is it is a negotiation. It's a meeting. It's kind of a meeting of the comfort zones. Everybody has their own comfort zone, and that's based on their experience and, and, and how much uh, uh, you know risk they're willing to take. Right. But that comfort level you, you got to kind of meet them. They, they got to find a meeting or a joining place before you can get an assignment. It also, I think, negotiating safety issues like that is good for everybody. It opens everybody's eyes uh, to to what hazards might be present. Well, it, it stimulates it stimulates the thought process. People are saying, "Well, hey, I didn't see that before," or, or maybe uh, maybe if we did this, but nobody's going to look down at you for saying no, uh, because you, like you said, your your comfort level is not there. You know, it, it's just a matter of explaining your situation and, and, you know, understanding, you know, what everyone's feelings are. I remember giving an assignment to a, a crew and they said, you know, we don't like the idea because yesterday we were here and this is about the time of day when that fire took a good run. Um, that's good information, you know, I mean, to me, and that was information I didn't have. And if they would have just said, no, we don't feel safe doing that, well, you know, I, I wouldn't have learned anything from that. They and wouldn't have learned anything from that. It would have been a, a, a just kind of a frustrating situation. You might have took it kind of the heart, huh? It, perhaps. Or you might have just got another crew to go down and do, and do that assignment for them. And they and would be faced with the same risks. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. I think another thing that we have to pay particular attention to, especially in the upcoming years, is something that uh, Hector made a little bit of mention to is with the new national fire plan, 
all these new people that are coming in. Um, there's going to be a lot of you know greener people, maybe not as experienced people now these days. And we got to make sure that when we're giving assignments, that it's um, you know to their level. You know, uh, maybe maybe they're not quite as experienced as what Lamar's crew would be, or, or Brad's crew, or, or the jumpers. But that's one thing we're going to have to start really thinking about here in the next few years. Knowing their limitations. Knowing your limitations, and yeah. don't be afraid to say, listen. I, I don't really have, you know, I don't have the experience to be doing this. Good point. I hope people are brave enough to do that this year. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next one. How about uh, what do you do when, when management has unrealistic expectations of, of line personnel? And this is when, you know, you get an assignment that may be safe, but totally unrealistic or impossible. And this happens occasionally. Lamar, you got any comments on this one? I got a great example, actually. Uh, Nevada, uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we were on one fire, uh, and we lost our lights, our bumpers, uh, and we were just got in, it kind of beat up pretty bad after the one fire. Well, we get into camp, and all of a sudden, we got to go to another assignment. We got another assignment. And they want us there that night, our first light the next morning. Well, uh, they want to get the buses in and try to bus us up or get some vans and get us up. But all of a sudden, if you know anything about shot crews, uh, those rigs are, are everything to us. That's our mobility. Uh, if you take the rigs away from us and, and, and you limit us on, on tools, we can't actually do what we're, we're put there to do. It takes away that type 1 status, more or less. Um, we went up and did it. Uh, we wired some lights up. And it's one of those situations where, again, we negotiated and we said, okay, we can, we can make this happen, but we need some time. Uh, we got to have lights to go up there. But those, that's one of those situations where management wanted somebody on that fire immediately. They wanted to get some personnel on that fire and we just weren't able to get there. So in our opinion, it's more, it was unrealistic for us to go up there at that time. It was unrealistic for us to actually be out there without our rigs. Um, and like I said, we ended up being there, but, but it was one of those situations where we had to negotiate. And I think that's what you got to do a lot of times. And I think sometimes this situation arises because we have failed as firefighters, line firefighters, to relay good information. I think it's real imperative that when we come off the line after a shift that we get with ops, we get with plans, and we let them know what we're seeing out there so that they can make realistic plans for the next day. And, yeah. and I think that that in itself will kind of elim eliminate some of this where management's asking you to do things that really just aren't going to happen or can't happen. So it's, it's an information process. It's a two-way street. Good they can only make the, the best plans they can make is off of the information we're giving them. So. I think that happens a lot on larger fires. Anybody else? Well, I, I think that goes as well with the uh, your your district FMOs or your, or your uh, your uh, AFMOs. Um, management can only base their decisions, you know, on the the information you're giving them from the field. If they want you to accomplish something, but they're not giving you the resources or uh, the tools you need, uh, you know, and you're trying to attempt that you're setting yourself up for a bad situation. Um, you know, you just got to be honest. I, I know sometimes our egos might get in the way, but, uh, you know, we got to step back and say, hey, you know, this is something I can't do. Let's move on to the next one. Team transi transitions. They're always kind of tricky, and, and uh, as you heard in one of the clips before, there's a team transition watch out situation almost present. But team transitions are always confusing and potentially dangerous. Is there anything we can do to, to maintain safety concerns during a team transition? And this is from IA to type 3 or from a type 3 to a type 2, even type 2 to type 1. What do you think about this one, Nicole? Well, I think, you know, at this point, like you said, uh, team transitions are a definite watch out situation, um, listed or not. Uh, number one, you've got to maintain your personal safety. Maintain your personal safety, maintain your crew, your crew safety your integrity um, another thing is keep communication less keep communication lines open the frequencies often change during tr you know during transition times and you know just make sure you're still able to talk to the people talk to your joining forces you know whoever may be next to you um, if there's you got to make sure that you know if there isn't a working plan that you and the people on the ground are making a working plan keep it going during that transition time and if, if no one's in charge or if you don't know who's in charge, 
appoint someone. Make sure somebody's getting the, th the stuff done. Make sure we still have our lookouts up there, you know, that we still have our communications, that we're still keeping everyone posted on the escape routes and safety zones. The fire doesn't change just because there's new people coming in. Good I, point. <clears throat> I think a key thing on transition, uh, let's just say from the jumper's perspective, uh, being in the IC Type 3 mode uh, a lot of times, and we may transition it to Type 2, uh, keeping good documentation, okay, uh, good maps, uh, what kind of natural barriers we have out there, what resources we've already utilized. This helps a team that comes in to just so it'll work that much smoother. That's that much less stuff that they'll have to worry about and be able to now focus more on the fire behavior, the resources at hand, etc. So the more that you can help them out with all of those little things that start to accumulate, the smoother that transition is going to be for them when they finally take over that fire. That's a good point. So it's easier said than done, though. A lot of times during IA, you know, things are, are are bouncing pretty heavy right then, and you got your mind pretty occupied. But it's it's vital. From a, a helicopter's point of view, you know, it seems like during transition, your your whole mission seems to change sometimes. Going from an IA resource to a support resource. How about uh, you? Got any comments on that, Brad? You know. And that's a good point. And, and depending on where you're from and, and how you, you are utilized, you may, in fact, uh, become part of that transition yourself. You might, you know, you might have to just totally switch gears into a support role. And uh, that in itself, uh, you know, lends itself to a whole, whole new uh, uh, set of problems, you know, as far as equipment and, and people and personnel. Um, like Hector was saying, I think the the best way to do it is just keep your keep your documentation straight and uh, you know make it as a smooth transition as possible. Good. Hopefully, we answered that one uh, sufficiently. Let's go on to another one. Uh, I've heard people talk about situational awareness. Um, isn't that an aviation term, or does that apply to the fire line? I guess I'm just somebody just explained situational awareness. Hector. Well. Ted, I believe its origination uh, probably did come from aviation, you know, maybe cock cockpit resource management. Um, however, uh, today we have a little thing in our handy dandy incident pocket response guide, in fact on page uh, one, called risk management process. Uh, everyone should take a look at this, but uh, you'll see that uh, one of the first things on a risk management process um, is situation awareness. Uh, recommend that people go through this uh, risk management process, at least read over it, understand what's involved with it. You know, situational awareness to me is uh, it's basing judgments on your experiences, um, you know, what your, your comfort level is, um, drawing from your, your past experiences. Good point. Nicole, you have anything? I think, you know, it's pretty well summed up by these guys. It's just taking in everything. That'd be, you know, your fire behavior, past, present. Um, weather, you know, the objectives, the communications, it's, it's just, it's basically the whole, the whole thing, you know, taking it all in and being able to process it. And that's it, just being able to step back, knowing when to, to kind of back up and, and take a good look. In fact, another version of this, uh, I'm always reminded of look up, look down, look around, uh, which is another tool that to me is almost the same thing. It's basically just keeping your head up and, and looking around, seeing what kind of clouds are formulating, just watching all the little elements and all the little cues that we can take to help us out and help us be safer on the fire line. You know, Ted, and, and just real quick, uh, that's the responsibility of everyone. You know, like, refer, you know, 20 person shot crew, uh, everybody on there should be situationally aware. You know, engine, jumpers, hell attack, it's everybody's responsibility for your own personal safety. I and agree. Speak up. Yep, and speak, speak up. up. Yeah, don't yeah. be afraid to say, hey, What's this? I'm seeing something here. Good point. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about after action reviews. Are they worth doing? What are they? Brad, you got anything? Well, after action reviews are, are a time where uh, you're away from the fire line. Uh, it's, it could be with briefing with operations. It could be just as simple as after initial attack, debriefing your crew. It's, you know, it's a time for learning, um, developing your, your people. Talking about the fire, talking about what went good, what went bad, uh, things people saw, things that they didn't understand. Maybe that's a, a time when they can get some answers. Lamar, we, you use those? We use them a lot. Um, debriefings. You were talking about debriefings. Years ago, that's all we called them, actually, debriefings. The last few years, we've been saying, been calling them the after-action reviews. 
Um, and it's a time where you, like you said, take those, everybody can ask some questions and, and it's important to get some feedback from each individual on what he's seen, what he thought was good and what he thought was bad, and what he, the hazards that he's seen out there that, that maybe I didn't see, some things that I didn't see. And then on the flip side, getting that information back to the division suits, the strike team leaders, uh, the overhead uh, operations, letting them know what we've seen out there and what, how we felt about how things went also. So I think, I think everybody needs to be involved in that after action review. I think another point that the after action reviews or debriefings, whatever we're calling them these days, um, you know, can focus on is we usually focus on what went wrong, but maybe this is a great time for us to learn what went right and make sure that we keep doing what went right. You know, we, we tend to dwell on what went wrong for, for you know, good reasons, but we should also can talk about what went right. I, I just kind of back to another analogy. Uh, let's take a pro football team. Do they debrief after every game, win or lose? You better believe it. They go watch films, they watch the blocking, tackling, et cetera. We're essentially, you know, a bunch of teams out there. There's coaches, there's players, et cetera. Uh, the smoke jumpers, uh, we try to debrief every fire that we go on. It may not be right afterwards because you're going right to another one, but when we have spare time, we'll sit down, we'll have everybody there that was on this incident. We'll talk about everything from the time we got the fire call, the time we loaded the plane, to the time we were overhead, to the time we fought the fire, to the time we came home. And it's really good because everybody gets everything out on the table. Uh, if there was anything that we can make better, we know it right then and there. If we just let it go on, slide, you never improve. Should be a no holds barred. Any, you know, mm -hmm. should be an opportunity for people to clear their minds and and say what's on their chest. And I think they should include people not only that were on the fire, that particular fire, but uh, people that were getting ready to go on a fire, or who were on a different fire at the same time. Because I think there's lessons to be learned on every fire. And I know I've learned a lot uh, from hearing jumpers or, or other firefighters coming off of fires and debriefing or going through an after action review. I can hear about fire behavior. I can hear if they had any problems with tools that I may end up having in my hand when I get on the next fire. Uh, transportation, dealing with local dispatch, frequencies. There's just all kinds of things you can learn from other people's experiences in fires that were previous or, or different from yours. So. I think it's important that we share that information, not just with people that are on the fire with us, but everybody. Documentation also. Documentation. Let's not, let's not forget that. Let's document each, each, each act of action review. It gives you a good reference to go back to. Right. At this point, I'd like to ask the panel if they have any final thoughts about uh, any of the safety issues that we've looked at today. You know, at the beginning of this program, I challenged everyone to actively seek out one new mental trigger or awareness <coughs> that you can take with you to the fire line this season that will keep fire safety foremost in your mind. I'd like to ask our panel if they've come away with any new awarenesses or if they have any final thoughts. Nicole, what about you? I think, you know, we've talked about so much information here, but the one thing that I've really keyed in on is communications. Um, we really need to keep those communications open, talking to each other, um, you know, just making sure that people understand what we're actually saying out there. You know, I get in a hurry sometimes when I'm doing a briefing and, you know, may want to rush through it, but I need to step back, make sure my people are understanding me, making sure that, you know, I'm understanding myself for that matter. And uh, I think, yeah, communication is, is definitely the key for me. Another thing is, is that I'd sure like to see everyone out there this summer, you know, have a good time, be safe, and make some money this summer. Good. And communication is the key. You know, we're not going to be able to mention everything in this presentation. Uh, there's a lot of issues that I'm hoping your local facilitators and you guys are bringing up on your own in your own discussions. Brad, how about from the Helitac point of view? Do you have any words of advice? Well, you know, at this point, I'd like to thank the panel and, uh, and thank you, Ted, for your, your good job as a host. Um, you know, I guess for me, it's uh, use your training. You don't underestimate your gut feelings because they're probably right. And be safe, be professional, and have a good fire season. Thanks, Brad. And uh, it's been a pleasure too, but you know, I, it wasn't it wasn't that bad. <laughs> uh, how about from the world of smoke jumpers, Hector? Uh, any final thoughts on safety? Well, a, a couple of messages uh, to pass on. Um, being on a, a fire with Ted is in itself a, a little bit of a hazard. The guy wears so much uh, dippity do, it's like having drip torch fuel in the back of your pickup. On a more serious note, uh, I'm convinced that uh, you can never learn all there is to know about fire line safety. Uh, we listened to uh, numerous interviews today and uh, with the panel discussion and, and the exercises we have. Um, there are so many ways that you can process this information. 
uh, make it where it's a natural reaction. Um, you know, it's going to be a little too late out there, you know, when things go bad on a fire to uh, crack out the instruction book. Um, I just like to say you guys really need to know this stuff before you go out there. And there's a lot of things to learn. We've heard a lot of uh, very inspirational, charismatic uh, people, uh, the Paul Gleasons, um, you know, to the John Krebs, to refer to things in the uh, Little Incident Pocketbook, uh, Look Up, Down, Around, uh, developed by Jim Cook, you know, an old salty hotshot. Uh, Clark Noble, Paul Hefner put this book together. You know, there's a couple of, of you know, old firefighters that, that knew a lot about fire. So uh, take this stuff to heart. It was put together by people that uh, really knew what they were talking about. And uh, I hope everybody has a safe summer. Good points. Uh, Lamar, what about for the hotshot crews? You got any important points you'd like to uh, stress? You know, we're going to be putting in a lot of hours out there next, next year and uh, this upcoming spring and, and summer. And, and I think I would just like to close by, by saying something to John Krebs, that fire order number six. And it stands out to me all the time. And throughout this, this, this whole process, that's what st stood out to me more than anything. Uh, stay alert, keep calm, think clearly, and, and act decisively, and have a good season. And if you do want to make a lot of money and work a lot of hours, you need to get on Lamar's crew, because for some reason they just seem to do better than everybody else. We're taking applications right now, too. <laughs> and he's, he's always recruiting. Always recruiting. Well, anyways, I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists for taking the time to share their real-life experiences with us uh, and to help us out with this training. It's only by passing on these invaluable personal experiences that we learn from each other and we stay safe out there. A lot of good information needs to be passed. Thanks again. Well, that about does it for this portion of the refresher training. Uh, remember, there's additional information in your workbook about fireline safety as well as uh, a list of websites and other reference material that, that you could take advantage of these resources. So remember, safety is your responsibility. Please take it seriously. Your facilitator will also be passing out an evaluation for this course. Please take the time to fill it out and let us know, you know how you think we did. The BLM training unit takes your comments to heart and we're going to use them to update this program for future refresher training modules. So let us know your thoughts, suggestions, and ideas. You still have one more important, very, very important module left and that is uh, with your facilitator you will review and practice the, the proper deployment procedures for your fire shelter. It is every firefighter's goal to retire from this business without ever deploying their fire shelter. But if that event ever occurs, this training could save your life. So, but before you start shaking out those shelters, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Good luck on a safe fire season, and I hope to see you out on the line. Really, you still have to every, I really, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, keep on asking yourself, can you back up and get a larger picture? And, and are you wasting your time trying to be so aggressive on this small portion and go bigger picture. And that's really what we did. We just took the helicopter up a couple, you know, a little higher level, looked and found roads at a bigger picture and burned off from them. And, and safety wise and tactically, I was, you know, confident that was exactly the right decision. What you have to have in place, I think, though, is teaching personnel on the ground to relay to the incident commander that that's what needs to be done. Hey, our ground tactics are not working, whether it's sagebrush and hey, it keeps on breaking out behind us, or you're in forested type to where this is just too thick, we can't do a direct on this, this steep portion or whatever. One, relaying that onto the incident commander. Two, uh, having confidence in your personnel to realize that they know what they're talking about. You need to adjust your tactics and, and go larger. And three, managers from fire all the way up to land, resource managers, not being critical of fire personnel to say, how come you didn't try to stop it? Uh, things, things tend to escalate. Problems tend to escalate without people really noticing them. So. Um, it's kind of like uh, the 18, 18 watch outs, you know, you're, okay, you're violating one watch out and then I'll, you're violating two and then three and then four and the step from three to four watch outs doesn't really, doesn't really trigger anything in your mind. Well, okay, we're violating one more watch out, it's not a big deal. But when you step back and you go, well, shoot, you know, we were violating no watch outs an hour ago and now we've got five watch outs that are, that are being violated. Uh, you know, maybe we should step, step back here for a minute and figure out what we're doing. That's situational awareness. It's, it's, um, it's kind of the ability to, to step back from what you're doing and, and look at the big picture, and, and you need to do that every now and again just to take stock on what's going on. Another thing that I would suggest for IA resources that are going to a multiple jurisdictional incident being, say, for instance, the forest, the BLM, um, urban interface type stuff is involved, 
Um, the thing that I would really stress to them is that when you're being dispatched, if you don't understand or didn't get who the IC was going to be, you find that out, you call back to dispatch, make sure that you understand that. You also need to understand what frequencies are going to be running off of. And once you get there, you make sure that you can speak with the IC and the other folks on the fire before you start your fire suppression. Because if you can't talk to them, that's just a really bad situation. And a lot of times when we dispatch people out, we'll say that during the initial dispatch, but the folks are getting ready, jumping in their rigs. They may not hear it. And any, if there's any question, they need to call back to dispatch. Well, as, an, as the, the thing that a ground pounder can do that will help me out as an air attack, uh, the thing that helps out the most is make sure you, you, you know what your air to ground frequency is and that you're monitoring that frequency. Um, you know, there, there are times when I'm busy, I'm, I'm monitoring three or four different frequencies. I know that the people on the ground sometimes have local fire departments on, uh, so they, they're monitoring three or four frequencies. Occasionally things happen really quick and I need to talk to people on the ground like right now. So, you know, in my mind, that's, that's the biggest thing they can do to help me out is know what that air to ground frequency is and monitor. Never be afraid to learn anything new and never be afraid to, to ask the questions um, and be concerned about, about yourself and your crew going into a situation. Just because you're new doesn't mean that you can't raise concerns that maybe no one else has thought about. Um. I guess I feel ultimately I'm responsible for my own safety on the fire line and um, and I think when I first started fighting fire my first supervisor he insisted that I attach myself to someone that had a lot more fire experience than me and that that's the person that I would go to I could go to anyone with questions but you know that I guess as you become more and more experienced you depend more on yourself and um, you don't have to ask as many questions, but I think that ultimately, you know your limitations, and you know how fast you can hike, you know how strong you are, you know what you know about fires, and nobody else can be responsible for your safety but yourself. Enjoy your job. If you're not enjoying it, then it's work, then you're not paying attention. You gotta, you gotta want to be there. You gotta want to do the job. Um, and you better be learning from every fire. You're not going to ever know it all. But to me, the basic the reason I'm still here is I have fun. I like doing it. No matter how much I know or how much I don't know yet, it's still fun. And I would say keep it fun. <laughs>